biodiversity. It underpins global food security, health and clean water. It's also essential for mitigating climate change. But the alarm bells have been ringing for some time, with one million plants and species facing extinction. There is hope governments will agree on new ambitious goals at the UN Nature Summit, a once-in-a-decade event taking place in December after a two-year delay due to the pandemic. Meanwhile, all over the world, local groups and communities are no longer waiting for government, UN or corporate action. They are taking action themselves. We're working with the Woodland Trust of what kind of species we can start to restore to there to bring and attract sort of new animal species in. So we've had a golden eagles visiting us here and when we start to restore those types of habitats, that's going to then bring in new species here which we're really excited about. In the southern uplands of Scotland, the Langham community is one such community who have decided it's up to them to restore the balance between economy and ecology. They've created the Terrace Valley Nature Reserve. So in the beginning, this was what, an impossible dream? It was, it absolutely was. So the land came up for sale in the end of 2019 and then the community embarked on a huge fundraising campaign that went international. Um, it was just a whirlwind. Donations came pouring in, a little like the rain on the day we visited. So we had six months to raise £3.8 million to bring um, this land here, 5,200 acres of Langham Moor and the Terrace Valley into community ownership. With help from thousands of people around the world, we did it. We made it happen. And they've just finished another mammoth effort, raising £2.2 million to buy 5,300 acres to double the size of the reserve. So it's huge, it's landscape scale, and it's the largest community land buyout in the south of Scotland. So what we do here is really special because it can inspire other people to show what is possible when communities come together and it can really show the impact we can have when we come together and what we can actually impactfully do for climate emergency and, and nature emergency. The UK is one of the most ecologically depleted areas in the world. Only half its natural biodiversity remains. The charity Rewilding Britain is hoping to reverse that damage by encouraging communities to allow nature to flourish, so less management is needed, making it more affordable and sustainable. Terrace Valley is now part of that network, and Jenny Barlow is the estate manager, one of a small team brought in to restore and develop this reserve. So you've got the land, what's the plan? What are you trying to achieve? So I think the headline is that we're, tr we're managing this land to create a, a diverse nature reserve to, and there's, there's sort of four pillars to what we're trying to do. So number one is obviously it's nature's restoration and then number two is that we are making a verifiable contribution to the climate emergency through restoration of forest and peatland. Um, and then number three, I probably should have said this to number one, but <laughs> that people are really at the heart of what we're doing. And the reason why the community bought this land is so that it is an asset for community regeneration and to provide new opportunities and a new chapter of, of opportunities for people who live here and who might want to come and live here in the future so that the young people growing up in Langham and in the area see the benefits of us owning this land, of the community owning this land, whether that's through increased access to the outdoors um, or that is opportunities like jobs, training um, and being able to just feel the benefits of us owning this, this huge amazing asset. Like many country towns, Langham is long on beauty but short on jobs. In 1994, the Langham Initiative was formed as a partnership between private and public sectors to revive the fortunes of a town once reliant on textile mills. Margaret Poole was the chairperson and is now a trustee. Margaret, tell us a little bit about the history of Langham. Well, Langham is much reduced compared with what it used to be. Um, at its height, I think the population almost hit 6,000. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, it's just over 2,000. But it's still a very independent-minded place. So the industry in Langham, it was textile, isn't it? It was so, textiles. Yeah. Um, agriculture, agriculture played its part, as did forestry. 
Um, but textiles was the mainstay. And when I first came to live in Langham um, in 1964, the mills were going full blast. We even had night shifts and there were workers came from Italy to work in the mills. It's taken a generation to accept that we're not going to have full-time mill working again. We have one mill left and they are extremely busy. So the Langham Initiative came about because you were looking for other ways to employ people and what could you do in the area? Yeah, well, we started off uh, from quite early on looking at nature. It was on our doorstep, so it was always an educational thing. And it wasn't until the Clue Estates announced that they were going to sell the land that our ideas suddenly expanded and we thought there was so much more we could do about it. But at that time, our ecotourism manager, who had qualifications in environmental science and wildlife, he took it a stage further and said, why don't we look at it in the, you know, the, the big picture, look at the big picture, what we could do with this land if it was ours. And it gave the local people a sense of ownership. The idea that started out trying to save the town became a project to save the environment that would benefit all. It's beautiful, rugged land, but humans have changed and tampered with this habitat. For a long time, it was owned by Baclure Estate, used to graze animals and shoot grouse, where the birds are flushed out so hunters can shoot them on the wing. Now it's under new community management, new restoration techniques are being explored to return it to its natural state. The community will own the land all the way up to the horizon, so it brings in peatlands at the headwaters of the Taras Valley catchment and then the river runs down through River Meadow and then it comes into ancient woodland and then it comes into moorland which we're standing on now um, and a lot of more peatland so we've got a very sort of rich diverse habitat uh, but there is obviously a lot of habitats that are lost and missing um, and which we're going to be working really hard to restore over well as the community on the land. So what are those pieces that are missing? So there's a lot of woodland that would have been here that isn't here now. Um, and we're actually starting to see as we stand here, little trees popping up everywhere. Um, so the grazing pressure is being reduced on the land. So nature's already starting to restore itself. Around the world, habitat destruction is the biggest cause of biodiversity loss. The Terrace Reserve wants to reverse that. In the first five years, it will seek National Nature Reserve status. But the land has already been designated a special protected area because of hen harriers, a UK bird of prey. It's hoped Terrace will become a breeding stronghold. Kat Mayer has been brought on board to work with schools and the community to provide environmental education. You've got hen harriers on the reserve. Uh, I mean, they're endangered, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. So they historically and still currently are quite heavily persecuted. So because they nest on grouse moorland and moorland habitats is no longer being run for grouse shooting, um, it means that we can provide a safe habitat for the hen harriers to nest and um, to raise their young. And then, um, yeah, hopefully they'll keep coming back every year. There are five active nests on the moorland, which I'm told are good numbers. But the hen harriers are far from alone, with a great variety of wildlife already on the reserve, and that's expected to increase. I think it's really important because even though we are only just out of the town, I find that a lot of the children that are coming out from the schools onto the reserve have either haven't been out here much, if at all, um, and just don't really know much about the site. So I think it's a really good way of getting them to engage with the land, especially since it is community owned and allows them to give themselves a sense of ownership over it and um, actually understand why it's important, what lives here. Here, a number of the bird boxes along the river are yet to have residents. But not all of the boxes are for birds. Some are home to pipistrelle bats. So looking at the bat boxes, do they climb up from underneath? Yeah, so they use the slits in, that create a ladder and then go into the slot in the bottom of the box. Mm -hmm. And with pipistrelle bats, you can get um, more than 60 bats in one box at what? a time. They, they, they must be tiny, are they? They're, they're really small. They weigh about the same as a five pence piece. <gasps> 
And um, yeah, so they're communal roosters and you can get loads of them in one box. And you put up several boxes on one tree because they don't want to be in direct sunlight, so they move around based on the direction of the sun. Ooh, fascinating. 60 in one box, that is not a very big box. No, but they're very small bats. <laughs> Still, that's overcrowding. That's like, being, that's like being on a train in London. <laughs> Back on the moor, Jenny is showing me another treasured part of the reserve, peatlands, which are a type of wetland. They don't look like much, but they have global importance for biodiversity and also as a carbon sink. Peatlands are found in 180 countries, cover 3% of the world's land area and store at least 550 gigatons of carbon, more than twice the carbon stored in all the world's forests. But just like many places around the world, the reserve has been partly drained for commercial reasons, as you can see from the long lines of drainage ditches, which severely impact the environment. This would have been a very boggy, wet kind of habitat, and then that's the ideal conditions for the peat to keep developing over like thousands of years. For decades, dried peat has been used as a fuel or fertiliser. People were unaware of how vital it was to keep in the ground, but in the UK, the government has announced plans to ban peat-based compost by 2024 as part of its net zero carbon strategy. How big are the peat areas that you have on the reserve? Oh, we've got considerable amounts, so it's like it's, um, about a thousand, over a thousand hectares of peat. So yeah, it's big, it's a lot, and a lot of that is deep peat, so that's like a deep carbon store. Um, but a lot of them are in a degraded state, so they are giving off more emissions at the moment than they are sequestering. Peat bogs are dense wetlands filled with partially decayed vegetation, originally sphagnum mosses, cotton grasses and other shrubs, which retain moisture. They capture CO2 through photosynthesis, but waterlogged conditions and acidity prevent this vegetation from fully decaying when it dies, meaning it retains carbon that would otherwise be returned to the atmosphere as CO2. Instead, the decaying matter builds up very slowly over thousands of years to become peat, which can be metres deep. The layers build up by one millimetre a year and act like a sponge retaining water. In its natural state, peat layers can contain between 4 to 25 times more carbon than a tree. 60% of the world's remaining wetlands are made of peat, but when peatlands are drained, the peat oxidises. In the UK, it's estimated the degraded peat releases 10 million tonnes of CO2 every year. To find out more about peat, I chatted to Jack Barton from the Crichton Carbon Centre, who's worked on restoration efforts in the area. The work is vital as only 22% of the UK's peatlands are in their natural state. So the oldest peat bogs in the UK are about 10,000 years old uh, and about 10 metres deep, uh, so they started forming uh, at the end of the last ice age. Peatlands are really important for biodiversity, um, so peatlands will support a whole host of uh, amazing animals, birds uh, and insects. Uh, not only that, they're really important for water quality and flood prevention. So sphagnum moss, for instance, can hold up to 20 times its, its own weight in water. Um, so, so the peatland will act as a massive sponge um, after high rainfall events and, and hold that water and, and help prevent flooding downstream. Is the degradation of peatlands down to human intervention? Yeah, largely. Um, and, and of course, um, that's going to become more exacerbated with climate change as well as we get warmer temperatures, higher rainfall events, um, which will exacerbate that erosion. So in terms of restoration for this, um, you can do it in lots of different ways, but these are called like grips, these drains that are going through, and it's called grip blocking. Um, so you go through and you just fill up these ditches and then they gradually just re-wet with water and it re-wets the landscape. So here, that's what you can do here, but in other places it's where the peat is bare and you've got large areas of ground where the peatland's exposed and washing away and eroding, it's about re-establishing all of the vegetation and the habitat and the plants on the top so they hold the water. Based on the Scottish membership of Rewilding Britain, it suggests around 1.7% of Scotland is rewilding and it's largely being driven by landowners and land managers and sometimes restoration needs chainsaws. So why did you chop down these trees? Because it goes against everything we've been hearing, plant more trees. Yeah, so the, these trees 
have always been planned to be chopped down in the long term because this is a non-native plantation of conifers. Yeah. Um, so they are not as good for biodiversity as our own native woodland. And one of the aims of the reserve is to um, benefit nature, benefit people. Um, the trees here um, were planted for timber um, and they have got to a stage where they needed to be felled. But what fast-tracked the whole process was Storm Arwen last year. Um, so it came through and took down almost all of the trees in this plantation. So that's why um, we have employed contractors to come in and fell the timber. Once the timber's off site, um, we'll restore the site to the woodland that you can see around. So this is just anything around the edges that's still standing, that's, that's good. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. so that's, that, this, that is from this country. <laughs> Jane Sayers is an outreach advisor from the Woodland Trust. More native trees will also help with the riverbank erosion, flooding and provide spawning grounds for fish. So how many trees are you going to plant? The idea is that about 2,000 trees will be planted within this area with the hope that there's natural regeneration topping that up. And But how many trees are you going to be planting you know, over the whole nature reserve? The whole nature reserve, oh gosh, I'm not... I'm thousands not and sure. thousands. Yes, <laughs> thousands and thousands. So we have around about 45 to 50 hectares where we, of new woodland creation, which will hopefully be a mixture of natural regeneration and planting trees that we grow on the reserve ourselves. The Taras Valley Estate is an ambitious community project balancing ecology and economy. Before the land was bought, the Langham Initiative carried out a feasibility study and put a business plan in place. They know it must also be a sustainable legacy for the community and ecotourism will play a role. Old buildings will eventually become bunkhouses or outdoor education centres. So all these buildings came with the land? They did, um, the farmhouse, the steadings um, all around here and obviously all the landers as far as you can see wow. and five other properties as well. And sheep? Uh, yes, yes we are. We own 17 sheep. Oh, well done. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till sharing starts. Great. <laughs> Angela Williams is the development manager, making sure the reserve remains economically sustainable into the future. But it's a balancing out about community needs, what's the best use of a property, best use of the buildings, how can we actually sort of develop a commercial activity that brings in income but supports the aims and objectives um, of what we're trying to do with the reserve. I guess you've got to have so many ideas. You've got the land, but you need, to, you need the money to keep it going, we don't do you? Indeed. And you're going to plant trees? Yes, so this here is going to be our new tree nursery. We've just had uh, funding from Scottish Forestry and the Woodland Trust. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about that because this is going to mean we can harvest seeds from all of these forests that we see right in front of us. Mm. We can harvest the seeds and we can do volunteer training and show people how to harvest the seeds. Mm. And then we can actually grow trees here and plant them here on the reserve. Mm. Um, so that helps with the sort of native forest restoration um, and all the skills and employment and all of the sort of social elements that we're trying to build mm. into a nature based approach. But also in terms of what Andrew was saying earlier, about the long-term economic sustainability that helps with that because once it gets grown to a certain point we'll be able to sort of then you know there may be an opportunity to sell those trees mm. further afield and we're not just using them on the reserve so that's a really exciting project and that you know we'll be having 60,000 trees grown in this little area oh, wow. uh, by the end of the year yeah. so yeah, and you'll all really come up with a watering can each yeah, is that pretty much it, it? Yep. 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 yeah yeah but then in, in maybe in two or three years time you can buy a tree from Terrace you know yeah. we'll be able to yeah. sort of um, you know either sell products to, to visitors um, or just locally but also also, if it becomes more commercial, we can maybe export to other woodland projects around as well. So it also kind of helps with the climate challenge side as well because we're reducing the carbon footprint of not bringing trees in and what have you. So, yeah, it's a kind of win-win on so many different aspects. And you must just wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, we could do that. It's funny you should say that, yes, that notepad at the side of a bed. I said that I wake up and then I forget. And then, but, um, no, it, it's, it's, I mean, it works quite well together because although we've all got different um, areas of expertise and responsibility, there's a lot of bouncing off ideas because something that starts off as a, 
a kind of community or schools project, then suddenly there's a spin-off and we've got a wider impact from it that might have a commercial arm in the future. So there's, there's constant, constant mm -hmm. bouncing off ideas yeah. off each other. And then when you need a break from the office, you just, all, all of you just come up here. Yeah, and, yeah. And, if nature's therapy. Just, yeah. Yes. <laughs> like me, you may be feeling a little exhausted at the scale of this project, but the temptation was too great when Bakalu Estates offered to sell off another chunk of land. So this is what the community bought, this great big pink bit. It is. So this is the full 5,200 acres that's now in community ownership mm. as of March last year. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is all the... And this is the town of yes. Langham, there on the edge. Mm -hmm. Yep, so, the, so you can see how significant this land holding is because it's so close to the town mm. and the benefits that you know we can provide through the sort of restoration of this whole land area. Mm -hmm. You know, it will start to bring the benefits. You know, we'll see those benefits come back to the town, and that's one of the really important things about what we're doing here with our land ownership. Jenny has yet to update the map with the new land purchase. Yet another job to add to the list. So it will carry on all the way up here, mm -hmm. and this little parcel. So it doubles the size of the reserve, and it brings in the headwaters of the River Terrace, mm -hmm. um, and it basically means that the community would own an entire sort of river catchment. So it's landscape scale in terms of what we can achieve with the restoration of the land, and also all the sort of nature-based opportunities that that will provide for the local economy as well. Mm -hmm. And what's all this here? Is this commercial? Yes. So we do in the south of Scotland. Commercial forestry of sort of Sitka spruce plantations is a very dominant land use here. Mm -hmm. So what it means under community ownership is this is safeguarded. And does the um, commercial, does this impact your land at all? One thing that we do have to keep doing is sort of cutting the, removing the na non-native um, Sitka spruce that um, sort of blows in from nearby plantations. So that is something that will have to be a continuous thing that we'll have to do mm. under uh, community management. But it's, um, it's a very good volunteer day. And over Christmas, we did actually sell them as little Christmas trees locally <laughs> to fund the reserve. So we made it was a silver lining. <laughs> and so, I mean, there's so much more land the community could buy. I mean, any plans to just buy up everywhere around here? Yeah. Oh, you're probably a bit tired from that, no. <laughs> So at the moment, there aren't any plans for any more land buyouts. I think we're all knackered, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, so there isn't at the moment. Yeah. Um, no, there isn't. But yeah, I think this, that'll keep us busy for quite some time. The Scottish Rewilding Alliance is running a campaign for Scotland to declare itself to be the world's first rewilding nation, which would include a pledge to ensure 30% of Scotland is rewilding, which will need political backing to succeed. And there is hope when you consider the Scottish Land Fund donated £1 million to the Terrace Valley fundraising efforts. How excited are you about what the Langham Initiative could achieve with this land? I think it could be it could turn the fortunes of the town round. Um, and it will provide a focus for younger people because we've leached young people over the last 20 years. Kids, if they're bright at all, go off out of the town to other places and they don't come back except for special occasions. Um, and I feel that that's... Um, how could I put it? It's an opportunity lost. Young people give life and sustainability to a town. Um, and we need to retain some of these, that talent. They are much more conscious, I think, this present generation of young people um, about the, the green element and what we must do in future to protect what we have and to nurture it. People say we must save the planet. In fact, the planet will be just fine without us. We're actually talking about saving ourselves. To do that, we must protect the world's remaining biodiversity to avoid a global ecological collapse. The Langham story is a metaphor for environmental action worldwide. When we save our environment, we save ourselves.